Uh, good morning uh, and good afternoon and good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Abta Mufkadu. I'm a nutrition team leader We Save the Children US, and I'm also um, I'm also a Momentum Country and Global Leadership Nutrition Focal Expert. Uh, thank you for joining the this important and timely webinar on social behavior change to improve maternal nutrition, exploring new resources, uh, which is organized by Momentum Country and Global Leadership, collaboration with uh, USAID Advanced Nutrition. Uh, Momentum Country Global Leadership is part of a suite of awards funded by USAID to improve family planning, maternal and child health, including nutrition and partner countries around the world. And Advanced Nutrition is USAID's uh, global flagship nutrition project. Uh, Please continue to introduce yourself in the chat box. Uh, at least you know, if you can mention your name, organization, and country. Uh, we'll have uh, a Q&A session after the presentation. Uh, please drop your question in the Q&A box throughout the presentation, and I'll request presenter to respond to your question later. Uh, as you all know, optimal mater maternal nutrition is critical for maternal health and nutritional outcomes, uh, as well as Infant, young, infant and child growth development and future health. However, maternal, maternal malnutrition, including anemia, remains high and unabated in many countries. Maternal nutrition receives limited programmatic emphasis. Uh, today, USAID Advanced Nutrition and Momentum Country and Global Leadership will share their reviews, experience, tools on social behavior change to improve maternal nutrition. Now I'm going to introduce the agenda and our distinguished speakers. Uh, the first speaker is Laura Itzkowitz. Uh, she is a nutritional social behavior advisor with USAID Bureau of Global Health. She has worked in social behavior change, community health, uh, community health and nutrition across three continents. Laura is going to present overview of maternal nutrition, social behavior change vision. Uh, Marsha Griffiths is the second speaker. Marsha works with momentum and country global leadership on nutrition social behavior change. She is a president of the MANOF group. Marsha has deep technical expertise in nutrition and social behavior change demonstrates through multiple impactful program innovations. Marsha developed uh, the behavior center programmatic appro programming approach known as behavior integration, as well as trials of input practices technique for testing behaviors before they are promoted in programs. Marsha will present the postpartum maternal nutrition behavior profiles. The third presenter is Dr. Kate Dickon, who is an associate professor with the Cornell University Public Health Program. Dr. Kate conducts formative and implementation research on maternal and child nutrition for security and the effectiveness of social behavior change interventions. She was previously with the Division of Nutrition Science at Cornell as part of her work with USAID Advanced Nutrition. She authored a scoping review of that explores social norms and child feeding and the forthcoming review of social norms and women diets. Our last speaker is Mariam Diaketi from Mali. And Mariam is a regional technical advisor for Francophone Africa and research with Agency for All. She focuses on social and gender norms, shifting intervention for sexual and reproductive health of adolescents and youth, as well as other vulnerable population. She coordinates the USA Advanced Nutrition Community of Practices and Social Norms for Francophone Africa. Mariam and Dr. Kate will jointly present social norms, a key ingredient in maternal nutrition social behavior change. Now I invite Laura to present overview of maternal nutrition uh, social behavior change vision. Laura. Hi, thanks everyone. It's so exciting to see so many people on here um, from all over the world. And it's great to see that there's such an interest in SBC for maternal nutrition um, specifically. We all know that improving women's and girls' diets and access to nutrition services, including nutrition counseling, is critical to maternal health, child survival, and children's health and nutrition. Women have distinct nutritional requirements throughout their life, with the highest nutritional vulnerability during pregnancy and while breastfeeding, a period that's often referred to as the first thousand days. Maternal nutrition is critical to preventing malnutrition and fundamental to reaching global and national nutrition goals for women and for children. We're all here today because we know this and we recognize that we are not where we need to be globally with maternal nutrition. 
USAID's investments seek to protect nutrition in the first thousand days to ensure that women and children are well nourished and able to live healthy and productive lives. Many efforts are underway globally to reach this vision, as many of you, I'm sure, are part of those efforts. High quality SBC interventions are fundamental in our response. A key tenant or principle of SBC is focus. Experience shows that trying to do everything all at once does not lead to desired results. Instead, less is more. Therefore, quality SBC starts with prioritizing the desired behaviors in a program or service context to focus research, design, implementation, and measurement on reaching these outcomes. Today, we're going to learn about two resources that can help programs and services to sharpen their focus and more deeply understand your prioritized behaviors. One resource was developed um, by Momentum for the postnatal period, a critical but often overlooked time in maternal nutrition. The other resource um, developed by USAID Advancing Nutrition is related to social norms um, as common but often unaddressed drivers of maternal nutrition behaviors. So with that, I'll pass it over to Marsha to get started into the technical content. Hi, thanks, Laura. Um, and I just want to echo how exciting this is to see so many people interested in maternal nutrition. Uh, so I'm going to share um, some work that we did in Momentum that was to be part of a whole package of um, tools related to the postpartum period, the maternal and newborn postpartum period. And of course, we started because we wanted to be sure that nutrition um, was included in that package. So, um, and to really shine a light on the postpartum period. So that's, I'm gonna be focused on that. This postnatal period is defined um, by WHO as the first six weeks after birth. Uh, next. So we kicked off by looking at the context, what was going on programmatically um, in this postnatal period for nutrition. And it will not be a surprise to most of you on the line that we found um, kind of poor programmatic focus generally with maternal nutrition, which Laura highlighted, um, especially outside of this prenatal period. And in part, there just is because there's an absence of strong program or service delivery platforms that reach women after this postnatal period, or those that do are not being utilized. And I also want to highlight this um, view that although we often found things that um, the title was pre and postnatal maternal nutrition, um, frankly, seven eighths of the emphasis was on the prenatal period, and we found hardly anything being done in the postnatal period. And the use of the same tools and information cutting across um, both periods. So that's kind of the context for this. Next. And as part of our review, though everybody highlights this import, the importance of the postnatal period if we hope to do anything to really improve overall nutritional well-being of women. Um, just to reiterate the situation here, is it is a critical period, these first weeks and months after birth, for the physical and mental recovery of women following pregnancy and childbirth. Um, women are often required to resume work almost immediately. Um, and so they're not only recovering, they're also starting back with their normal um, duties and we hope breastfeeding. So a lot going on in this period. And just to be very clear, that means that the energy requirements for women during the postnatal period are high. Um, they're about 30% higher the energy requirements over pre-pregnancy and 15% over pregnancy. This is, of course, if they're breastfeeding. So high requirements and, um, and we're just not coming close to meeting them. Um, and that 
The other thing to emphasize here is most people recognize that it's also a moment when women are hungry and a lot of the, uh, you know, nausea and and poor, you know, feeling um, feeling poorly during pregnancy has evaporated. And so they're often very willing and open to um, improving their diets. Next. So as we got started, um, as Laura said, we wanted to really define and focus on just, in this case, two behaviors. And they're very obvious ones, right? Eating sufficient quantities, mothers eat sufficient quantities at appropriate frequencies. And the second one, of course, focuses on variety, on a diverse diet daily in meals and snacks. And you're all saying, well, of course, these are sort of generic behaviors. And of course, these cut across both pre and postnatal period. So, you know, why can't we use the same thing? But I want to call attention to that question. If we are looking to support women in achieving these behaviors, we have to understand what underlies them. What are the factors that influence whether and how women can practice these behaviors? Um, that is critical to actually having some success with supporting them properly. Uh, next slide. So we took a deep dive. Um, we again went back to the literature, the evidence from programs, from research, uh, that had attempted to improve, and in some cases improved, women's postnatal nutrition. And we developed a behavior profile. So what goes into, into a profile? It's kind of like, you know, we wouldn't talk about trying to put together a program related to diseases without understanding the epidemiology of the disease. And here we need to understand what underlies the behavior, its ecology. So we develop these profiles and there's basically three main components, the behavior and the steps required to appropriate to optimally achieve the behavior. Looking at the factors, and you can see here, we have three big categories of factors, structural, social, and internal and important supporting actors at all levels, institutional community, um, and of course, within the family. And that then by understanding what's going on in all of these, that then allows us to go to the fourth piece of the behavior, next slide, which is the strategies and activities. And again, these relate to the enabling environment, systems and products and services, and demand for these and appropriate use. So this, when filled out and completed, now we did it at a global level. We looked broadly across almost anything we could, we could find. Um, but one can then take this global information and or just do it locally. But um, next slide. So this leads, this is a snapshot of what a completed behavior profile looks like. And it's just the top part of the one on diet quantity in the postnatal period. And you, know, you can see the behaviors and the steps and uh, the different boxes completed. What I wanna call your attention to is what is highlighted in yellow. So when these tools are done online, and I think we're gonna put the links to these in the chat so you can actually look at them, um, you can create pathways to behavior change. And that is that the factor, in this case, the factor that's highlighted is accessibility, um, and the need to have food year round, um, links to then supporting actors that influence that behavior and then lead to things that a program could do or try in that final column. 
So these are your pathways to change. And basically, you know, if you can't address those factors, you're not going to make a difference in the behavior. So it also um, can serve your M&E because it sets up these pathways. It sets up um, important actions that you need to monitor over the course of a project. Uh, next slide, please. So let me just spend a minute to say what were some of the highlights of completing these two behavior profiles, one on um, uh, the behavior of eating an appropriate quantity of food and the other, uh, the diversity in the postnatal post diet. Um, so we find, of course, in food access, um, under structural factors, that food access is really critical, um, both the affordability and availability of foods. Um, and of course, affecting, so there's some differences between quantity and diversity. And of course, affecting diversity is also people's interest sometimes in processed foods, uh, filling roles in the diet that take away from uh, diverse, nutritious foods. Um, and I want to also point out that while we look a lot at factors in this case that are restricting um, improved diets, we found that contact with a trained provider was important, was a positive factor in women realizing these behaviors um, on quantity of food, early contact in the early postpartum period, and for diversity of food, that continued contact with a trained provider. Uh, social factors, of course, there's cultural, religious, and gender norms that highly influence. And I'm so glad we're having a second talk on, on norms. These highly influence um, these behaviors. And a lot of, mostly on, in terms of restricting the diet, um, but there are some positive um, norms that, that protect the woman, uh, uh, particularly during the early periods. And then there are those internal factors. And I just want to stress the mental status of the woman and the role that depression um, plays in this period. But generally, they feel better. Um, and they do feel hungry, and that is a positive. Next slide. So another thing that we found in taking this deep dive is that although WHO defines it as the first six weeks following birth, there are often local definitions uh, or local time periods that um, determine what happens. And we found this is generally speaking kind of a a three part, uh, three periods uh, during which there are different treatments of the woman. Um, the first is really in the first one to three days, sometimes it extends to two weeks, um, where there are special practices, many of them restrictive, um, and they focus on both the mother and the baby, and they're often tied with recovery from birth. Then there's another period um, from those early days to about a month or when the child is named and attention to the mother is relaxed. Um, and attention begins to shift almost entirely to the newborn. And so a lot of things around her behavior are tied to, um, to breastfeeding. And she begins to go back to work and then about, you know, at a month or so, she's expected to pick up all of her normal duties and there's no recognition of her need for extra, extra food or special foods. And we're sort of back to normal. But she is, of course, not back to normal in many ways in terms of her diet. Uh, next slide. So I also want to pick up on this difference um, between the prenatal and postnatal period and how it might influence programming. So women in this um, postnatal period, of course, as I said, start to feel better. Um, and so they tend to shift from 
from their concerns, you know, anyway, from their concerns about um, not wanting to eat more, to not have a bigger baby and an easier delivery, to wanting to um, potentially alter their diet, um, sort of with some erroneous beliefs that by eating more or eating certain foods, their breast milk will either be of a better quality or quantity. So their both physical status changes as well as their view of how their diet affects them. And the interfamily dynamics also, you know, change enormously. Um, because a lot of times during the prenatal period, the family is, is concerned about the woman. Um, and this seems to just completely evaporate in most cases uh, postnatally as attention shifts to the newborn. Next slide. So I really want to encourage everybody to look at these behaviors, uh, these profiles, sorry, these behaviors also. But to look at the profiles, um, they are a resource open to everybody. And we found that they are useful to programs um, as you might be designing or rethinking your postnatal component. Um, and we found, I just want to highlight you know, one example from the Engine Project in Ethiopia, where that project did a behaviorally focused evidence review um, that really highlighted the importance of family support. But family support, what does it mean? How do we do it? So they took a deep dive into how family support could really make a difference. And that led to a big revamping of a program activity that they had ongoing, which were community conversations but those were just very general community conversations to then modifying it to do enhanced community conversations and actually separating into conversations with mothers separately, with husbands and with grandmothers. So that those factors important in that interaction could really be emphasized and developed. Um, and then there were times when they all came together, but just this minor tweak seemed to have made a big difference um, in outcomes in this program. Next. And as you saw in um, Engine, the profiles, this look at factors and whatnot influence the formative research. And I also wanna emphasize that, that if you're planning your formative research, pull up the profile and look at it and look through those factors. And are those important for your context? Yes or no? Maybe you say, oh, wow, we hadn't thought about that. Maybe we should look at this factor or a particular actor. So they can really help identify gaps and, um, and focus the formative, the formative research. Um, and finally, I wanna talk about counseling because that's, proven to be pretty important. Um, you know, as Laura said, it's prioritization and focus. And we know that, you know, just giving messages, just giving these generic messages really doesn't get us very far. So the profiles can help project teams really look at the factors. And if you can't address the factors in the counseling, um, I don't want to say it's a wasted opportunity, but you're losing a lot. And so, for example, in Rwanda, by looking at the factors in terms of helping women add animal source foods to their diets, it wasn't that they don't know about animal source foods. It's that it has not, in many cases, been sort of a traditional part of their diets, and they really need to know how, how are they going to incorporate these foods, a little bit of these foods every day in their diets. So it becomes a very different type of counseling. And again, in Egypt, as soon as it became clear and it, you know, it's very clear there that there are these sort of different periods postpartum, the counseling then can change 
to addressing the important factors immediately after birth. And they put a lot more emphasis on immediately after birth and then um, throughout the first couple of months. So it's proven to be super important um, for developing that counseling component. Uh, next slide. Yeah, and finally, so just to kind of sum up here, um, the, the exercise of developing these profiles started with defining the behaviors. What really is gonna make a difference to the desired nutritional outcomes? And then the deep dive, and I just, I can't emphasize this enough um, to identify these factors and supporting actors. What you have in the profiles that are in the chat is a global look and people really need to then do um, to contextualize it to local environments. And that crafting the program to address the factors and engage the supporting actors is what makes a difference. So again, the behavior profile tools here, are the, um, you know, here are the links and they're really a, a jumping off, a starting a starting place for you um, in the process of identifying gaps and finding new ideas, we hope, in some of these pathways. Um, and there's a brief also here in the, uh, listed here in the, on the slide. Um, so with that, I hope people put questions uh, in the Q&A box and I will pass it over to Mariam. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, all. Um, it is a pleasure for me to present on the social norm and maternal nutrition SBC. So next, please. As you saw, I will present it with Kate. So I'm going to present the first point of the outline you have here. Uh, sorry about social norms and maternal nutrition and Kate will go ahead with the next three point like overview findings from the literature and the application of SBC showing and maternal nutrition program and services. Next, please. Thank you. So you may know that there is a lack of knowledge on the social norm importance on the nutrition intervention and others. So norm matter and should be considered in intervention to improve our outcomes. So research found norms around child nutrition and mother nutrition, for example, like the time what we feed the child, how we feed it and by who. And also a guide was developed on social norm and nutrition to identify these social norm that influence child and women nutrition and develop intervention addressing this norm to strengthen uh, SBC intervention. So the guide has been testing with partners. Next, please. As you see here about some norms influence the maternal nutrition. Uh, women are aware of and even internalize norms like these, which are very spread and deeply ingrained. For example, a mother must prioritize food for family mother, family members even if they have enough information about what to eat. Their nutrition are influenced by, by the elder. So we must avoid certain foods during pregnancy, for example, or breastfeeding, or the baby will, the baby will be get or stolen. Next, please. When partner explore the guide, often they find restriction on what women can eat and cannot eat. We all know and hear about food restrictions. 
especially for women during pregnancies, but also during breastfeeding. Through rapid consultations with communities, we found different communities have different restrictions for pregnant women. And in some communities, women should not eat chicken during pregnancies. In some, it's the dog meat. In others, we found eating mangoes, pet nuts, or chili pepper are prohibited during uh, pregnancies. The result relating to safeguarding the health of the mother and child, especially during childbirth. Also, we identify the egg that is also forbidden to women of childbearing age as well as children to prevent children from becoming a thief. Most of the prohibition are associated with family totems. All misfortunes and illness are explained by the transgression of these norms. All elders are, are required to perpetuate these norms to the younger one. So none of this on its own limits women's overall nutritional intake, but have implications on what to promote. Uh, also the gender related norm were similar across the communities. So if women eat a restricted food, the sanction comes from the family home, ancestor. So uh, next, please. Mother-in-law oversee how the norms are in, for, in force and make decisions on women's foods. So we had some norms that can be used in positive ways to improve outcome. And we have also some instruction restriction by women feeding during the pregnancy. So I pass the floor to Kate to continue with our presentation. Thank you for your invitation. Hello, everyone, and thank you so much for being here with us. Um, and thanks, Mariam, for that wonderful illustration of how social norms come into play when we're trying to promote um, maternal nutrition. Now I'm going to talk a little bit more generally about social norms and behavior and then talk about some um, findings from the literature. Next slide, please. So what are social norms? Um, they're the often implicit informal rules that most people accept and abide by. So they're unwritten, sometimes unspoken, um, sort of group beliefs that people may not even be that aware of, but they still affect their behavior because they involve what's a typical and appropriate behavior in a given community. Next, please. And we generally divide these into two categories. Um, there are descriptive norms, which are just perceptions of what's typical, what others do, what we always do in my community. So for example, in my community, pregnant women get special foods to eat. And so that's an example of a norm that might be positive for nutrition. But then there are injunctive norms, which sometimes carry a bit more weight. These are perceptions of what is appropriate what others expect me to do. Um, and so, for example, my community expects me as a mother to sacrifice my own food and feed my children and husband first. So that's an example of a norm that might restrict nutrition. Next, please. So why do these matter? Well, they matter because they affect people's behavior. And the reasons that people follow norms tend to go quite deep because social norms are embedded in the culture and they're reinforced through social interactions throughout life. 
Um, and the, particularly those injunctive norms come with rewards and sanctions or punishments, which would usually come from influencers or reference groups, which just means the people around you whose opinion matter to you. And so we just heard of the example of the influence of mothers-in-law. Um, and, oh, sorry, I'm not ready yet. Um, so people often don't have the power to go against those norms or the agency, uh, and that's true of women in, in particular contexts, but also not everyone wants to go against those norms because they value them as part of their social identity. It's part of what it takes to be an ideal woman, for example. Next slide, please. And social norms also affect how we view others' behavior. Um, and so, for example, the exact same behavior of bringing fast food home could make dad a fun guy, um, but could mean mom's too lazy to cook. Um, and so we have to be careful what we're asking people to do when they might be subject to these kinds of judgments. Um, and so here are some other examples related to the topics we're dealing with today. If vegetables or greens are seen as women's food and meat is seen as men's food, then a man eating vegetables can be seen as less successful or less manly, um, whereas a woman eating meat can be seen as greedy or somehow neglectful of her family. Next slide, please. So often in our nutrition programs, when we're giving women advice about their own nutrition, we ask them to eat better and rest more. Um, and that's been going on for decades. And we need to think about what's happening that influences those behaviors that may constrain women and families in following those recommendations. Um, and that gets into the kind of behavioral analysis that Marsha was talking about. So here's a, an example or, or a, a diagram showing how various social norms around food, around the roles in the household, around ideals um, based on, on women and men's roles, and the power hierarchies that are also normative can affect a woman's um, ability to access food, to take time to rest. It affects the decision-making in the family and whether she has a role um, and whether she has agency to take up the recommendations. And that, of course, leads directly to the maternal nutrition behaviors. So the reason to look at social norms is because they are so relevant to the effectiveness of our programs. Next slide, please. So given our interest in the importance of these, of these norms and trying to understand how we can tackle them, we conducted a systematic review of the literature. This was a team from USAID Advancing Nutrition and Cornell University. And I'm gonna talk very briefly about the findings here. This is has been submitted, but it's not yet available in publication. Next slide, please. So our objective was to look at intervention approaches. So specifically an intervention that was trying to improve women's nutrition, either through their dietary intake or their rest or both, but that addressed the influence of social norms specifically, social norms and gender expectations. And we wanted to describe the intervention approaches and the types of norms and aspects of women's diets and rest um, to look for implications for programs and research. Next, please. So I'm not gonna go into the methods in detail, but just to reiterate, we looked at all women of reproductive age and we were focused on undernutrition and we were um, requiring that the intervention address social norms, although often other terms were used like cultural beliefs or taboos. And we focused on low or lower middle income countries and looked at the four main um, databases where nutrition work is published. Next. So here are the results. Um, we were kind of astonished to have 6,000 abstracts or more than 6,000 um, that, that fit our search terms. Um, but then after we got through those, there were only 20 papers that met our inclusion criteria that I just talked about. Of those 20 papers, 15 focused on pregnant women, and 10 also included lactating women, but as Marcia mentioned earlier, postpartum was not a focus. Um, they were just kind of included in. Only five addressed all women of reproductive age, and these studies um, took place across Sub-Saharan Africa and Asia. 
The majority by far focused on women's dietary diversity and the adequacy of the diet. Um, five looked at micronutrient deficiencies and only three looked at reducing workload during pregnancy. Um, and this adds up to more than 20 because a lot of studies looked at more than one outcome. Next, please. So we found um, a range of norms, and this um, fits in with what Mariam just spoke about, that there was this sort of large category of gender or role-based norms that addressed sort of the amounts of food and rest that were considered appropriate for women, household food allocation, and family roles for men and women. And then within that, there were food specific norms. So particular foods that women should or should not eat or that were under their control um, because we included nutrition sensitive interventions that focus on agriculture. Next, please. So those food specific norms um, included the kinds of restrictions that we've heard about both from Marsha and Mariam, particularly during pregnancy and sometimes the postpartum period. Those of course varied locally by context and there were different reasons why that was felt to be an issue. Um, but then there were also studies that found expectations for special foods to eat during pregnancy or postpartum. And those often are more positive norms that can be built on. And then as I mentioned, some women, some foods are considered women's crops or things that are within the scope of women's responsibility. And a positive example was orange flesh sweet potato, which, you know, because it's a women's crop in certain contexts that can be prioritized then for women and children and it's very nutritious. On the other hand, foods like meat are often accessible only to men. Next, please. And so these larger gender role-based norms, as, as Maria mentioned, they tend to go across contexts and be very similar in a lot of places. They affect the amounts of food and rest that are appropriate. As Marcia mentioned, workload doesn't change very much, particularly in the postpartum period. We've all heard about um, differences in intra-household food allocation. And only one paper really looked at the degree to which these norms have been internalized so that women are, are um, perceiving their own inability to prioritize their own health or diet. Next slide, please. So what do we do about it? Um, I think these are the, the biggest learning points. What are the approaches that people were using? And for that, um, we found that there was recognition that it's important to shift restrictive norms, but also to build on existing positive norms. And that it's very important to engage the influencers, not just the women. And that involves husbands, mother-in-laws, other people in the community. And that means working at multiple levels through multiple channels. So home visits and counseling are important. Um, and we heard a little bit from Marsha about the, the kinds of counseling that are needed and the focus, but it's also important to facilitate discussion groups with family members because those are the ones who are influencing these behaviors and enforcing the norms. Videos and social media were used to try to change norms at the, at the level of the community and also advocacy through opinion leaders, particularly religious leaders, or to create um, opportunities for change agents or champions to kind of demonstrate to others what it's like to go against those norms or how to build on those positive norms. Ongoing support groups for women, for men, for mothers-in-law held separately were another strategy because it can take time to shift norms. And then there was a need for gender-based curricula and gender transformative approaches. As we saw, gender underlies so many of these norms and people need a chance to process that and talk that through and see alternative ways of, of organizing roles um, in the family. Next, please. So in the review, um, the conclusions were, first of all, that social and gender norms are often overlooked in programs. And that means that we're missing one constraint on the uptake of recommended practices. As I mentioned, only 20 examples were found that actually tried to address um, social and gender norms in their promotion of nutrition and rest for women. Um, so that was very few compared to the 6,000 abstracts. And then another 
um, sort of lack of conclusion, it was hard to make a conclusion about change in social norms because most of the studies didn't actually measure them even when they were trying to address them. Um, those that did report you know, measurement also found some success in shifting norms, but many authors acknowledge that it can be difficult to change norms. And some of them even um, had particular interventions that didn't successfully overcome the traditional food customs, particularly among elders. Um, and so there's particular strategies that maybe weren't as effective or didn't last long enough to make that change. Next, please. So what are the implications then for SPC to improve maternal nutrition from what we learned from the literature? Next slide, please. So if we're gonna be telling women to eat better and, and rest more, what, what do we need to know um, to address the norms that might constrain that? Formative research is key, um, and that would lead into the kind of behavioral analysis that Marcia talked about earlier. You need to understand what motivates or drives the behaviors that you're focusing on. <clears throat> and there's a lot of different um, motivators and determinants, but norms are certainly part of that. And then that provides the information to guide design of a program that's norms responsive. It's important in m and &E to integrate questions on social norms along with the other determinants of maternal nutrition. And it's fine to, uh, to sort of get at in sort of, how would you say, like the individual perceptions of social norms, um, asking people questions and the degree to which they agree or disagree with them is getting a sense of their perception of the social norms. But in the long run, you're gonna want community level um, assessment to know that you're really shifting these norms and then design the research that assesses not only what norms matter, um, is it possible to change those norms? And then if those norms change, does that have an impact on the nutrition behaviors so that we understand the um, pathways for behavior change? We found very little um, research that actually looked at that pathway. Next slide, please. The implications for programs are to start with, um, you need a theoretical framework that includes norms as well as other behavioral determinants. Um, and that will inform the program approach and you can consider whether norms prevent or support each priority behavior working through a behavioral analysis of determinants. And then design activities to acknowledge and respond to these norms. And the, that can take you know, some extra work, but it has also benefits because those norms often affect multiple behaviors um, and they affect those behaviors over time. I think the key here is that um, often people mention norms at the end of the paper as an explanation of why their intervention didn't work, but we need to think about those norms early on and really address them. The key thing here is to engage the influencers, not just women, we want to convene women to help them directly, but we can't expect them to change the norms that surround them and that constrain their behavior. For that, we need to engage the people who uphold the norms. And finally, it's important to monitor for unintended consequences. If you're asking people to do things that go against the norms, remember that with injunctive norms, there can be consequences. As Mariam mentioned, if the child gets sick, the mother can be blamed for that if she behaved in a way that contravened those norms. So we need to do a community level work and support women and be aware um, if there are unintended consequences so that we can address that. Next slide, please. So finally, um, it's important to provide some resources and this was mentioned earlier and I think Lisa shared the link. Um, there is a guide that's been put together by um, USAID Advancing Nutrition, and it has resources and worksheets and examples of each step of a program. So you can use it from start to finish to design things or just use it at particular points um, that you're interested in. So please reach out to Lisa or Mariam if you would like to work with that or if you have questions about using the guide. Great. Thank you so much. Next slide. Um, and I'm going to turn it over now to Habdamu to facilitate our discussion. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Dr. Kate, uh, Laura, uh, Marsha, and uh, Mariam. So uh, thank you for uh, so, you know typing some question. I think we, our team, 
I've been trying to respond to some of the questions, but that there are important questions that uh, we'll, we'll answer in the next uh, only half an hour. So the first question is, um, is for uh, Laura, you know, if you can start in probably Marsha Kanadis. Um, adolescents are they sometimes, you know, they can be mothers either during uh, pregnancy or in you know, a postnatal period. So when, so how we can, you know, specifically address a different determinants of uh, adolescent mothers. Uh, and for Marsha, the question is, how is this considered in the behavioral profile analysis? Laura, you can start in Marsha Kanad. Great, thanks, Abtamu. Yeah, I think it's really important that we think about the needs of adolescent mothers and how they're different um, from older mothers because there are going to be different needs. And sometimes we do this when we talk about first-time mothers and in some countries, the first-time mothers typically are adolescents, but there could be an adolescent who has having her second child um, or even third child. And so it's really important that we understand the context where we're working in each specific country and know, are we working primarily with adolescent mothers or even partially with adolescent mothers um, and really make sure we understand how their needs differ and what do we need to do to reach them specifically um, and break down the barriers that they have to these behaviors and how those may be different um, than older mothers. And so, but, so we really need to think about that. And that's something that you may even create if you're creating behavior profiles, create a separate behavior profile for adolescent mothers to see how their factors are differ from older mothers. Um, or maybe you look at it as first time mothers, depending on the context as to what makes the most sense. Um, Marcia, do you have anything to add for that? I do not. <laughs> that is <laughs> very okay. comprehensive and exactly what I would say. Thank you. Thank you, Laura. Marcia, there is another question for you. So what, the question is, why did you choose uh, uh, diet diversity over diet quality of diet in the behavioral profile analysis? Was it intentional or was there any other reason? Um, yeah, I saw that in the, in the chat or in the questions. I don't um, exactly know what the thinking was behind the question. Um, Getting because we separated quantity from um, the diversity of nutrient rich foods, and maybe I should have specified that. Maybe that would um, answer the the questioner's um, thoughts here. Um, so it was diversity of nutrient rich foods, but we felt that those two things, how much people eat and the frequency, the factors might be different from um, the inclusion of nutrient-rich foods. So we separated those two behaviors. I think together they make for the quality of the diet, if you will. So um, I'll leave it there, but I'm certainly open to, <laughs> to more specificity with that, with that question. Thank you, Marcia. Dr. Kate, well, the other quest question for you is, uh, could you please comment on how to overcome you know, diet restriction is one of the uh, factor that's identified. Uh, is there a way to overcome a you know, postnatal diet restriction for, for example, local cust customs restricting new mothers from eating, uh, you know, different type of food for, for different reasons? Great, thanks for this question. Um, Again, in the in the literature, we saw very little attention to the postpartum period, so it's it's difficult to to speak to that directly. But I think the um, the approach generally is, you know, it's best to be as participatory as possible. We can say there's a norm that women don't eat beans or something in in their postpartum period, but talking to people and understanding what the reasons are for that norm. If it's just, we've always done this, usually if you dig deeper, there are reasons. And I think the best way to figure out how to approach it is to ask for the community to help with solving that problem. Look for the norms. Maybe there's a norm for, for women to breastfeed for a long period of time. There's a norm that women should be working. They need iron. Um, and so 
proposing back to the community, well, we understand that you have this tradition, um, but we also know that you value these things and this food or, or this you know, pattern of eating is gonna help women fulfill their other responsibilities. So what is the solution? Um, and I think the more that we understand, not just that the norms underline the be, underlie the behavior, but what underlies those norms, and then um, some really effective strategies have been to work with whoever's sort of community level opinions matter most. Um, often that's a religious leader. You would want to get your health workers on board as well. But it, it takes a comprehensive approach and a very, a very context specific approach that um, gathers what is it that people are afraid of that's underlying that norm and how can that be addressed? Maybe those foods can be prepared in a different way or um, you know, eaten in small amounts or something like that. And then to find champions who are willing to start doing that um, and, and prove that it's feasible and not harmful. Um, so it's a great question and I, I don't think it's easy, but with community participation, you should be able to find some answers. Thank you, Kate. Marcia, one question is about the application of the behavioral profile. Uh, the question is, um, is there any lesson learned from the application you, uh, of the behavioral profile for program design implementation? May not be specific for the postnatal maternal nutrition profile, but other profile. Um, yeah, hi, Justine. I think that was your comment. Um, there has been, um, yes, application of the, these global profiles to making local profiles. And I do want to emphasize that, that the global profiles are not the end all and be all. Um, they are to try to, you know, entice people to do this for their own programs and to not just start from, from a blank slate maybe, but to have some ideas to um, feed into local adaptation um, or local use. And so, yes, it has been um, very useful to, frankly, moving people away from just a focus on knowledge. The profile includes, all, as I mentioned, structural factors that may be influencing behaviors these social norms that we've just spent a lot of time on. And then these internal factors, which is where we always tend to put our focus. So, um, and uh, lo lots, lots of, um, of uh, applications of these, but, but I'll leave it there. I mean, it really is, it really has been useful to move people away from just this idea, oh, if only they knew, you know, we need to give them information to um, really looking, I mean, some of the barriers are oftentimes access barriers. And if we can't overcome the affordability of animal source foods, it doesn't matter how much we tell people to eat them. So um, anyway, I'll leave it there. But yes, they have been used um, pretty broadly, both in nutrition and outside of nutrition contexts. Thanks. Thank you, Marsha. There, there, there are questions on reporting and monitoring and how to measure uh, the shift in norms. I think that's answered in the chat box by Lisa. So I'll, I'll move to the other question. Mariam, this, this is a question for you, but Kate and uh, Marsha can add. Um, how do you, you know, adjust norms in a community without uprooting cultural values or insulting cultural beliefs? Are there specific strategies or frameworks for doing this well? Miriam, did you get the question? Um, I'm not sure she's I'll still. Take the ultimate thing. I don't see her, am I? Yeah, she had another commitment. Oh, okay. So probably if, if or Lisa or Kate, if you can answer this question. Lisa, do you want to go ahead? Please go ahead, Kate. Um, all right. 
I mean, I think it's, it's going to sound repetitive. It's kind of how I answered before. I think engagement with the community is, is key and understanding um, what the, what the reasons are not just poo-pooing. Oh, it's just, it's just a social norm, but that recognizing that that goes deep and that's embedded in culture um, and really talking to people about you know, what are the other norms that maybe could be built on in order to, to make changes? Um, I think always looking for, for supportive norms is, is key because you don't want to just be telling people they're wrong and changing everything. Um, but working with the elders in the community seems like a really important part of this, um, not just because they uphold those social norms, but because they maybe understand them and can help to be an example of, of ways that things can be shifted. But it's a great question. And I think it's essential to not just go in and say, oh, we're gonna change norms. Um, that's not the appropriate role for someone from the outside. That needs to be done with, with the, the folks who understand those norms and who understand the culture. Yes, sir. thank you, Kate. Yes, sir, do you want to add? Oh, that's perfect. Thank you. We have so many questions. So, uh, Marcia, one question is uh, starting from Guatemala. Was, has there been an attempt to look at ethnic diversity as, as an underlying factor for maternal nutrition? Ah, I think that came from Maggie. <laughs> Hi, Maggie. <laughs> um, no, well, the profiles that we posted are, you know, these large global profiles, but um, yes, I mean, obviously in a place like Guatemala, it's extremely important to be very clear where you're working, you know, what, what ethnicities, et cetera. So um, I'm, you know, I'm going to say yes on a, on a local level. Um, and I think that's something that happens too often is that we tend to blur some of some important distinctions. Um, the earlier question about the adolescents, you know, if we're really working with adolescents, they need to be separated out. And this kind of uh, in-depth behavioral look needs to happen specifically um, with them and their influencers. And same thing you know, ethnically, I, I think we need to be much clearer than we have been in the, in the past. So I don't know, Maggie, if that kind of answers your question. Um, and it's challenging in a place where um, there, there are many, um, but, but really important to recognize, um, to recognize those differences. Thank you, Marcia. I think this is probably for Kate and Marsha again. Uh, do you have any example of a formative research methodology that you that is used to populate the behavior profile? Is there any specific methodology to use? Oh, I started to answer that in sorry, oh, okay. I don't That's I started fine. to answer that in the QA, but um I don't think there's and, and Kate, please weigh in, but I don't think there's any one methodology I think people have used an interesting mix, ranging from, of course, depth interviews. Um, and, you know, and then there's focus groups. I just, I won't belabor the focus group issue, but I think one has to be extremely careful um, in using focus group research. Uh, very specific uses for that, and I think it's overused. Um, and then we're quite partial to trials of improved practices, which actually engage people in trying new practices um, so that you understand both the determinants of what people are currently doing, that is those factors that are influencing what they're currently doing, and what issues are going to arise with trying to practice new or different behaviors. And those can be as illuminating or more illuminating than understanding the determinants of current behaviors. And they are often very different. Um, so anyway, a wide, a wide variety of methodologies and it kind of depends on, on what you're looking at. Over to, over to you, Kate. 
Um, thanks. I would definitely agree um, about trials of improved practices. Um, they are they are a great way to to find out what the constraints on behavior are. And I learned everything I know about tips from Marsha. Um, so I'm glad she mentioned that. I've also had some luck um, in focus groups using a sentence completion kind of story approach. Um, we use this with, with men in Tanzania where we're asking them to engage more in, in caring for, for the children. We didn't use it for, for maternal nutrition, but setting up a story and then having people talk about what happens and what maybe the man could do in a situation it sparked a little more discussion than some focus groups where we just ask people their opinion and everybody tends to agree with each other. So I think being innovative about that can help. Um, I guess another, this isn't formative research so much, but I think people are often interested in knowing how to include social norms in a survey um, because of doing M&E. And with that, the, the best structure seems to be making a statement like um, my community expects me to, or I do this because, um, and asking people to agree or disagree strongly or, or less strongly to that. Um, and so that's one way of sort of monitoring things. But I, I do feel like formative research to understand the determinants of behaviors really, really have to be qualitative. Um, so a lot of depth interviews and with a lot of different sort of members of the community, elders and then women and men, uh, religious leaders to really understand what's happening. Thank you, Kate and Marsha. Laura, this is probably, if you can understand the others cannot, but there has, the, well, the question is, you know, there has been a focus more engaging, you know, different stakeholders in addressing, you know, social norms. And But the question is what has been done to help empower mothers themselves beyond increasing their knowledge and advocate for, for, for mothers. It is basically about empowerment of mothers to take uh, action or to address, to practice uh, optimal behaviors. The question for me? Yes, you can okay. start, mothers can add it. Just checking. Uh, I mean, I think there's a lot of examples of a lot of projects around the world who are doing um, some great work on engaging mothers to empower them to change their behaviors um, and really looking at how do you bring communities together? How do you increase women's agency within communities? Um, I'm not thinking of specific program examples off the top of my head, but maybe others on the panel are, but I bet a whole lot of you who are participants in this webinar could even give us examples in the chat of what your projects are doing um, in specific countries to really look at how do you increase women's role and, and empower them within their community um, to make these decisions and have this decision-making power. Okay, do you want to add about the caregiver resource? Sorry, have time. can you repeat that? I, I see that, you know, is there anything about the caregiver resources? Um, yeah, we are we are trying to develop a model and, and think more about measurement of a set of kind of intangible resources that a caregiver needs in order to provide care for children, but it would also be relevant to care for herself and her own nutrition. So these are based on Patrice Engel's work on resources for care back in the late 90s. Um, it's things like self-efficacy and mental and physical health and um, freedom from any violence, um, as well as things like time sufficiency that are a little more practical. Um, and social support is really one of the major resources that, that women need. Um, and these resources usually are not things that she necessarily um, has access to on her own. It involves the family and the community to, to support those. And it behooves an intervention to make sure those resources are in place because without those resources, um, a caregiver may not even be able to participate in a program, let alone to take up and practice the, the recommendations. So we have this, this model listing these resources and we're really hoping that people start to 
pay more attention to those and, and measure those um, similar to, to social norms to see the degree to which those do facilitate behavior change. Thank you, Karen. Marja, one, one additional question is, in the social behavior change process, uh, you know, at what stage do we think working through conceptual models and using behavioral theories would be most beneficial? May not be specific for maternal nutrition, but for all behavior change uh, approach. Um, yeah, I'm sorry, I didn't see that question. So what is it where you use the model? Behavior change models. At what stage of the behavior change you know, model or intervention do you think you know working through conceptual models or using behavioral profiles would be most beneficial? Ah, um, I, well, I don't know why it's HPM, but like the HPM. I I mean I guess my uh, my answer is. At, at every stage, I, I hate to, uh, I, I'm having trouble just kind of highlighting one. Um, from, you know, the minute you're starting to conceptualize a program, um, it is critical that behavioral considerations come into play. Too often we wait and, oh, it's when we're designing the communications component of a program. No, no, no. When we are sitting down to conceptualize a program, behavior should be a fundamental part of the discussion. Just like we look at, you know, we understand the disease, as I said, the epidemiology of the disease. We look at all how all these other systems function. We need to look at what is going on with behavior, because if we can't help facilitate behaviors that are going to be life affirming, then what the other things we do many times don't matter. Uh, we always look at our, you know, evaluations after the, and they always say after the fact, oh, if we would have paid more attention to the behavior, if we would have known about this social norm. And so I just, I can't say enough about it being part and parcel of overall program design. What is it going to take to move behavior so that we're improving access to affordable foods? Um, we're looking at this social norm question, et cetera. So at the outset, and then all along the way, and I showed those pathways in the um, behavior profile, they can help you set up some of your tracking so that you're not just looking at behavioral outcomes, but you're looking at whether those factors are changing. Are you making some inroads into some of the norm, norms that are influencing behaviors? Are there more affordable foods available in the market system, for example? Um, if we can't move the factors, we're not going to move the behaviors. I don't know if that's the answer to this question. <laughs> um, I will leave it there and I'm open to follow up, of course. Over. Thank you, Marcia. Before I let you go on this, but there is one question about, you know, uh, about breastfeeding mothers, you know, nutrition during breastfeeding. And, you know, with the increasing trend in obesity and in the behavioral profile, I think there is one of the behavior is increased intake. Uh, and also diversifying the food. So how can you balance you know, the issue of overweight uh, or obesity during breastfeeding period in some, because it, you know, the assumption is during breastfeeding, mothers say they don't work a lot. They, they may be provided more food and they may increase in weight. So how can we really balance the increased intake uh, or quantity vis-a-vis -vis the obesity and overweight? Uh, well, I'll start on this, but other people, please chime in. I think there's many people on this call that can probably address this better than I can. But one of the things that's really important is when you're deciding 
on your priority behaviors, that is when you can mold and shape the behavior that you feel is going to get to the nutritional outcomes that are desirable for the population. So, you know, we, because this is a global profile, we gave sort of equal weight to increasing food quantity um, and diversity, but it may be that really in a given context, you really want to focus on those nutrition, a, a, a better variety of nutrition rich foods. And of course, one of the factors in achieving that is the, in some cases, the potentially high intake of processed and non-nutrition rich foods. So you might be focusing more there if the issue, you know, truly is, is overweight. Um, so I think that very first selection of prioritized behaviors is, is very important and it would be important in this in this context. Um, I'll turn it over to anybody else who wants to comment. Okay, so Lisa, if you, if you want to add, please. Um, well, I would just say I, I completely agree and, and this goes to um, Marcia's previous point about about when to use behavioral theory and to start right at the beginning. And, and people really need to build their own theory of change to reach the outcomes that they identify. And that would happen right at the beginning and then probably be modified based on the formative research. And so if overweight and obesity postpartum is a, a concern in the, in the given context, then yes, your, your behaviors that you would focus on would be somewhat different. And also, you know, in, in such a context, weight loss, if that's desirable, can also be a motivator for, for continuing to breastfeed. So I think that identifying this idea of focusing on the key behaviors, building your own theory of change, what you want to accomplish, and then looking at all those determinants addresses a lot of these, these questions. And that is the first thing that people need to do, but then it's also, a living document and it, it changes as you learn more and gain input from the from the community. Thank just you. to yeah, Go just ahead. to add just a little, I mean, this theory of change can that can be derived from your behavior profiles okay. in many, in many cases. I mean, you have you need to focus on your behaviors, but then in constructing the behavior profile, those pathways to change give you your theory of change. Absolutely, yeah. Over. Thank you, Marsha and Kate. I think that the last, this is probably the last question is behavioral prioritization. I think it, it came up in several questions. So Lisa, if there are any tools, if you can share in the link, how to prioritize behavior. I think there are questions, you know, are there any behaviors that that were not included in the behavioral profile, but we think it is it is important. So probably behavior, I know that there are behavior prioritization tools, so it's good to share to the participant. So I'll jump in on this one. Thanks, Hapton. Okay. Um, and hopefully someone can put into the chat a link to some of the tools that USAID Advancing Nutrition has developed. Um, they've developed a really great behavior prioritization tool that will walk you through the steps of how do you determine, look at the data, what you have, what you know already um, to determine how to prioritize behavior. And then something to think about, I know it's a really, it's a mental block for a lot of people to think about how we know all of these behaviors are important. How do we do just a few? That you wanna think about it as layering and, and starting out to be not too overwhelming. You start out with just a few and then maybe you look at every year, you look at it and see, hey, what have we achieved on these behaviors? Have we achieved enough that maybe we can deprioritize them and prioritize new behaviors? Um, and so wanting to regularly reassess, maybe it's every couple of years. Um, 
and think about layering and where you focus. And it's not that the all of the behaviors aren't important. It's that what will be the first ones that you work on and then you add in others over time. Um, so it's really important to, to think about it that way and recognize that we may have things like care groups or other um, groups where they're doing nutrition education that covers a range of behaviors, but, and that's okay. And then you still focus, you maybe go a little bit more heavily on your prioritized behaviors and mention those every session where a care group session may only be focused on a specific time period. Um, but then you also mention your priority behaviors, the few of them. Um, so there's ways to really think about how do you how do you link these in to activities you're already doing, but then also how do you really focus on them so that you can move the needle and, and get a lot accomplished. So I'll pass it over to anyone else. I just want to acknowledge, I think I saw a question about um, how to how to do this with your national government. Um, and so it's it's so wonderful that um, Laura and folks at USAID, Advancing Nutrition, and you know, have recognized the importance of, of focusing on a few behaviors. Um, but I don't really have experience with with what happens when you're talking to to folks at your ministry and they want to cover everything. Um, so I think that's an important question that I can't really answer, um, but hopefully some of these resources will give people ammunition for their argument on the importance of, of focusing on a few behaviors. Not that the others don't matter, but that you can only do so much at a given time. And you can only ask families to make so many changes at a given time. Yeah. Yeah, I think you know when when I was in Ethiopia working on the not on the maternal behaviors on RYCF, so it, it it took a long process, you know, to cut the behavior. I think from sixteen behaviors to probably eight or nine behaviors, but it took you know a lot of negotiation, discussion, and also what it means. You know, do they really the families and the health provider have the resource and the ability to do it? So. It it it, you know, it takes a lot of resource, but I think it can be done. Especially, I think the tools uh, would be really helpful rather than doing it, you know, in a systematic way. If you use standard tool, I think that would help, you know, both the government as well as the, you know families and communities. They understand, you know, uh, to understand what is the need for prioritization, and but it can be done. I think, uh, but that. That definitely need also some kind of you know assessment to inform you know which behaviors are really visible and doable by at the end of the day should be doable by the mothers or the caregivers. So I think it's possible, but I think it's going to be a long process. I think we are at time, so there are additional questions, but we will respond to those questions by email. But if is there anything from the speakers you want to? respond to any question, but uh, do you have anything to to respond to any of this question? But I, I think we don't have a lot of much time. No, I just want to thank everybody. This has been great. And to hope that we can continue uh, to really look at maternal at maternal nutrition and answer some of these questions uh, in, in programs. That's the best way to, to get answers. Um, no, so thank you and thanks to the organizers. Thank you, Marsha. I think really I appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, I really appreciate all the participants. I think they share their experience. Also. They have shared you know, their experience in the chat box for uh, uh, some of the questions. So I think we'll include that in the email that we'll send out. Uh, but I would like to thank you know all the presenters and also I would like to thank also the participants. I think this is important. It's not for the sake of webinar. I think some of the resources and some of the presentations, I think you can people especially from countries, I think you can use it to inform your programs. Uh, I think it's uh, it's I think the behavioral profile resource, the other resources that are already shared are really important because maternal nutrition is important, especially the postnatal period is usually neglected. That's something to, to consider. 
So on behalf of ITM, the organizer, I would like MCL and advanced nutrition. I would like to thank all the participants, the presenters. I will, uh, uh, I think, you know, we'll send out, you know, the recording and, uh, and, and share some of the responses uh, via email. Um, uh, thank you for joining. I think with this, we can conclude the webinar. Thank you, everyone.